Major funding for Election 2020 Arkansas PBS Debates provided by AARP Arkansas. Hello again, everyone. Thanks very much for being with us. I'm Steve Barnes, and we continue Debate Week here on Arkansas PBS. At this hour, the race for Congress in Arkansas's 4th District. The candidates in alphabetical order, Frank Gilbert, the Libertarian Party nominee, William Hansen, the Democratic candidate, and Representative Bruce Westerman, the Republican nominee and incumbent. The candidates will be questioned by a panel of Arkansas journalists. Byron Tate of the Pine Bluff Commercial, Una Lee of KHBS, KHOG, and John Lovett of the Southwest Times Record. Each candidate will have two minutes for an opening statement. Each will have two minutes to respond to a question with rebuttals limited to one minute. And each candidate will have two minutes for a closing statement. Now, the debate sequence was determined, as always, by a drawing in which the candidates or their representatives participated. Our timekeeper tonight is Angela Cook of Arkansas PBS. And before we begin, we would note that we have followed all protocols for the COVID-19 era, especially distancing and masking. Masks removed only moments ago. And with that, our first opening statement is by Representative Westerman. Sir. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, AETM, for continuing to host these debates. Thank you to our panelists for being here today to ask questions. And I extend greetings to my challengers in this race, Mr. Gilbert, Mr. Hansen, and greetings to all of you watching at home. In my office in Washington, D.C., I have a simple plaque that has three phrases on it. Abide in love compete to win, and succeed through service. These are the guiding principles that I established for my office. When I hire someone, I make sure they understand these principles and that they have they are expectations for them. When I bring in interns, I go over those principles with them. We're living in tough times in this country, but I heard it said one time that tough times don't last, but tough people do. With God's grace and mercy, we will overcome the pandemic and we will be better on the other side. I believe that I support the goals and the policies that are best for this country, whether for the environment, the economy, taxes, health care, or the pandemic. I look forward to making my case today why I should remain your representative for Arkansas's 4th District. Mr. Westerman is thanked. Mr. Gilbert, two minutes. Thank you, Steve. Thank you to the journalists who are with us today. Most especially thanks to Arkansas PBS for doing this again. It is important and I'm proud to be here and glad that you did it. Every two years, Arkansans and Americans in general get to ex exercise their vote. They elect executives and representatives. And fortunately for me, when we do that, we're not electing the smartest, the most pious or the best looking candidates. We are electing representatives, people like ourselves, people who live where we live, act as we act, and in most ways is just one of the guys. Unfortunately, no ladies this year, but in some cases, I am that person. There is nothing spectacular about me there's nothing important about me. There is some seasoning that has made me what I am, and I'm proud of that seasoning. I will carry that Arkansas flavor to Washington, and I will keep it as long as I'm there. I'm not beholden to any political party. The Libertarian Party is an odd amalgam, a mishmash of mismatched people. They bear no strength on me, I am unrepentantly failed to be a 100% libertarian. I do not have large donors. No special interest group 
has their hooks in me. I would love to be your representative in Arkansas, in D.C., and I ask for your vote in this election. Thank you, Mr. Gilbert. Mr. Hanson. Mr. Barnes, members of the press, uh, my challenges, Congressman Westman, Mr. Gilbert, uh, and I want to first thank Arkansas PBS and AETN for all the great work you do in uh, keeping the public informed. The pandemic has certainly altered the way we intended to campaign this year. And so I, I'm thankful for this opportunity to introduce myself to your viewers as well as to the voters here in the 4th District. I grew up in Camden. My family has been in Wichita County since before the Civil War. My great-grandfather on my mother's side was born in 1843, so my family has been in Arkansas almost as long as Arkansas has been a state. I'm from a family of seven. My father is from a family of 10. My mother is from a family of 12. My father passed away in 1992. On his deathbed, he called my older brother Richard and I into his hospital room and requested that Richard return to Arkansas to take care of the family and take care of my mother. In honoring my father's request, my brother Richard uh, made it possible for his siblings to go out into the world to pursue careers in law, medicine, the military, and in social work. Richard passed away in, in 2016. When he passed, I knew it was my time to come home, so I made plans to relocate back to Arkansas from California, where I've been living for the last 20 years, raising my two kids with my wife. I'm a veteran, a lawyer, and a teacher, and I believe very strongly in community and civic engagement. I'm running for Congress because I have a particular set of skills that I want to put in service to the people of Arkansas and to the 4th District. So I'm going to ask for your vote in November. Thank you. Mr. Hanson, thank you. Our first question tonight comes from Byron Tate of the Pine Bluff Commercial, and it goes to Mr. Gilbert. The Affordable Care Act is more popular now than it was when President Obama was in office, with more than half of Americans viewing it favorably. But the law's constitutionality is being challenged in the Supreme Court by Republican attorneys general, including our own Leslie Rutledge. If the AGs are successful, the ruling could disrupt the health care of tens of millions of Americans. In Arkansas, because of Obamacare, the percentage of uninsured has dropped by 50%. With no replacement health insurance legislation being considered, what will happen to those Arkansans who rely on the Affordable Care Act for health insurance? Thank you for that question. And it is an important and, frankly, kind of scary one. I think the Affordable Care Act is more popular now than it was at its inception because it has been improved. The legislative process uh, got rid of the despised individual mandate, and when that went away, what was left was much more palatable to the average Arkansas voter and taxpayer. As to the question, what will happen if the courts act in a particular way, it's hard to say. I don't have a crystal ball. I can't guess what the legislature and the governor of Arkansas might do in the absence of that legislation. And I sure don't know what the Congress would do, but I know what Frank Gilbert would do as a congressman. And I would do whatever is necessary to make sure that anyone in Arkansas who needs help gets help. I'm not sure that the best way to do that is with another massive legislative program with taxes commensurate with the size of the program, but I do know that there are needs in our state and in our nation right now that are unmet. We don't need more, and I believe that the Congress and the President in the coming years should be able to take, take the steps necessary to ensure that no one dies in Arkansas or suffers because of a lack of health care products. Thank you. Gilbert, thank you. Mr. Westerman. Thank you, Mr. Tate, for asking that question. It's something we should be talking about more. Immediately after the American Health Care Act failed when the famous thumbs down vote, vote by Senator McCain, I challenged my staff and I worked with others and started putting together a health care bill. In February of 2019, I filed the Fair Care Act of 2019, and just last week I filed the 2020 version of that. And I'll say it's not just a House version, I do have co-sponsors in the House now, but Senator Braun from Indiana, 
filed uh, a Senate version of the bill. This is a bill that could be used to fix the problems with the Affordable Care Act right now, or if the Supreme Court strikes down the Affordable Care Act, it could be easily modified as a replacement. There are some things that were popular with the Affordable Care Act. There were problems with the Affordable Care Act. The things that are popular are coverage of pre-existing conditions and allowing students to stay on their parents' insurance while they're in college. We still have 31 million people uninsured in this country. The cost of health care continues to go through the roof. I'm an engineer. I said we want to design a health care plan that accomplishes three things. We want to cover pre-existing conditions. We want a lower cost for the taxpayer as well as people who are buying their own insurance policies. And we want to cover more people. And I believe we have accomplished that with the Fair Care Act. The Fair Care Act covers pre-existing conditions better than the Affordable Care Act. We lifted the language out of the Affordable Care Act that covers pre-existing conditions, plus we put a high insurance risk pool in the bill that does even more to cover pre-existing conditions and also would lower costs for everyone in the health insurance marketplace. We kept the exchange out of the Affordable Care Act. We did away with the employer mandate and some other things. The bill actually has 75 bipartisan pieces of policy in it. It's a sound health care policy. I think it's the best health care policy that's in Congress or that's being considered right now, but unfortunately it doesn't get the coverage that I think it deserves. Mr. Westerman, thank you. Mr. Hansen. What is this? The 75th time Republicans have tried to pass a bill to uh, replace the Affordable Care Act? When Mr. Westerman first introduced his Fair Care Act, uh, he had absolutely no co-sponsors, not even from his own party. And I'm very glad that we had the Medicaid expansion here in Arkansas, especially during this pandemic, because when people lose their jobs, they lose their health care. And the HCA and the Medicaid expansion has made it possible for them to be able to get health care. What the pandemic has done is exposed the gaps in our health care coverage in the country. I want to go on record to, to say that I think that health care is a right, as well as education through K-14. And the Affordable Care Act has done a remarkable job, as the questioner mentioned, in making sure that many Arkansans have insurance. And I think that we don't need to replace it. We just need to uh, fix those things that, that are problematic. The case before the court, California v. Texas, other area, there's a lawyer. Uh, it, it, the court should not uh, uh, make the ACA unconstitutional. They can sever that individual mandate out since the Trump administration basically zeroed out the, the tax that, that was approved uh, when it first went to the court. So I, I think we just need to quit playing around with uh, health care, especially uh, during this time. We need uh, universal coverage for everybody, and I don't want to get into the weeds about how we accomplish that, but, but I do believe that health care is a right and that we should go, go toward that in some kind of way in a, bar, in a bipartisan way. I appreciate Mr. Westerman's efforts in trying to fashion a bill, but I think it's clear that these market-based approaches that he's recommending are not going to work. In other words, you know, there are ways to, to involve the market and to make sure that everybody's covered. Thank you. Back to Mr. Gilbert, sir. You have one minute for rebuttal. It is odd to hear these gentlemen talk about bipartisanship. It is something that is rarer than hen's teeth these days, and not because of them. They are not the, the source of the problem, but they are or will be, I fear, willing participants in it. There is no way to govern a country of 300 million plus people and do it all one way. Nothing will ever be accomplished as long as the two old parties continue to fight and struggle with each other rather than the problems that face this country. The Libertarian Party offers you an option. I offer you a third way to handle problems like this without resorting to name calling or silly tactics. Thank you, sir. Ms. Lee has our next question, and it goes first to Mr. Westerman. Uh, Mr. Westerman, since lockdowns in mid, mid, uh, since mid-March, more than 63 million Americans have sought unemployment. Last week alone, more than 840,000 uh, new jobless claims were filed. Are we doing enough as a country to help those who are losing jobs due to COVID-19, and what should the next stimulus package look like? You know, thank you for bringing that up. 
Uh, as we look at this terrible pandemic that's uh, come upon our country, it's not something we asked for, but it's something that we're dealing with. Uh, the CARES Act, which was broadly supported in Congress, provided immediate relief through uh, stimulus checks, through unemployment insurance, and through the Paycheck Protection Program. The state of Arkansas received one and a quarter billion dollars uh, just in uh, direct payment to the state that could be used for um, pandemic-related costs. There's still a lot of money in that fund. We need more flexibility for it. The governor would like to spend about $100 billion on uh, broadband, but it has to be spent by the end of the year. We've got to, there's $130 billion left in uh, the CARES Act that could be spent right now if Congress would give the flexibility for the, the Paycheck Protection Program. We need to make changes on that. The bill was a huge bill. It was pushed through quickly uh, like it should have been, but we found out there's some things in it that need to be changed. Uh, we don't need to have another relief package that does stuff that's unrelated to the pandemic. Uh, I'm proposing that we fix the Paycheck Protection Program, that we put more money out for testing, and that we allow states to have flexibility to spend the funding that's already there. Uh, Speaker Pelosi has come up with all these other things to put in the bill that just quite frankly aren't related to the pandemic and they shouldn't be included in the bill and this is something that we shouldn't be playing politics with. Thank you, sir. Mr. Hansen. Well, I, I hope that everyone ha has a chance to read the uh, HEROES Act to determine for themselves whether or not those things that uh, uh, the Democratic Congress has in there are related to the pandemic. What's the real issue is that we, the Democratic Congress passed a bill way over four months ago and the Senate has yet to take it up. Uh, unemployment, uh, we needed those funds to continue the extension of unemployment benefits for, for citizens, not just in Arkansas, but across the country. This is not just an individual issue. This really helps uh, the economy because if people don't have money, they don't have money to spend to, to put the economy back together, which helps small businesses. So uh, we need another stimulus package. And right now the Senate is occupied with we're trying to force a Supreme Court justice in without taking up the whole notion of the help that the American people need right now. Thank you, sir. So Mr. Gilbert, two minutes. Another tough question. Y'all are y'all are doing your job. The problem we have with COVID is a natural one. The Chinese somehow introduced a virus into their population and that, that then spread around the world. And that's bad enough. But our government, both of the parties, have made it worse. At every turn, they make it worse by either not knowing the truth or not telling the truth, early on they assured us that it was not a big deal. Democrats in Congress said, come down to Chinatown, enjoy yourself, have a good time. Republicans reciprocated. And then suddenly it was a serious problem and masks would take care of the problem. Or maybe they wouldn't. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday masks work. Tuesdays and Thursdays, they don't work. And on the weekends, we're all free to have peaceful demonstrations any way we want to. The truth is, the economic problem that, that ensued after the virus was created by government at all levels. The federal government, the state governments shut down economies. The state governments in some states allowed and then forced COVID carriers back into old folks' homes. That worries me. But mostly, they dithered and they frittered and they tried to figure it out and they still haven't. Or if they have, they've kept it a secret from me. Whatever they do won't be enough. There's not enough tax money in the world to take care of the problem they created. Sir, Mr. Westerman, one minute rebuttal. I would just say this, the CARES Act was a Republican led initiative through the Senate. Our delegation worked with our senators to get important measures in the CARES Act. Uh, the CARES Act, I believe was a success. I believe it kept a lot of small businesses from closing. I think it uh, put money in people's pockets so that when they were out of work, they could 
uh, buy the things they needed. We did that a lot through employers uh, with the Paycheck Protection Program. Those are the things that need to be fixed. Speaker Pelosi did get a $3 trillion, quote, Heroes Act out there that was full of things like uh, helping the post office uh, and other issues, uh, helping out the art centers in Washington, D.C., things that were special interests that she was putting in the bill, putting tax breaks in there so that people like Mike Bloomberg could claim their state and local tax deductions in New York. Those are the things that are in the HEROES Act that I just can't go along with. But if we want to talk about serious help for the American people, I'm ready to negotiate on that. Mr. Lovett has our next question, and it goes first to Mr. Hansen. Mr. Hansen, uh, the national debt has increased uh, about $5 trillion, I think, since May. It's up to $27 trillion now. I'd just like to um, know what to, if you have a plan to address that and how that basically how the national debt impacts the, the nation. And what's your plan? Well, uh, we are in a, one of the most serious uh, recessions that we've had since the Great Depression. And uh, we've been forced to spend money because of the pandemic. And, and I'm in support of that. Franklin Roosevelt, in other words, in the 1930s, had to increase debt in order to really get the economy spurred again. I think we're gonna have to do that. I think we're gonna have to continue spending funds until we get the company, uh, economy going again. Then once it starts going again, we can start uh, seeing those revenues come in. I would also uh, reverse the big tax cut that President Trump and the Republicans uh, passed when they first came into office. That's the only significant piece of legislation that they've really done. And it has not helped uh, those at the bottom end of the tax structure, but it has helped those at the top in companies. So that's the first step I want to do to start recouping some of those funds that, that uh, caused the national debt that we have. Yeah. To Mr. Gilbert, sir, two minutes. Thank you. Our debt is nothing more or less than generational theft. My generation has lived well and done well, and we did it on credit. We passed the debt on to my children, and what my children and I are now doing is passing that massive debt on to our grandchildren. There is no way that I or my children will retire this debt in our lifetimes. It is theft, it is wrong, and we need to do whatever we can, whatever it takes to stop it. Fortunately, we're still in the process at a point where it can be taken care of without dramatic changes. When I was in junior high school, we had a school-wide debate on the national debt. The side that won that debate, if you could call it a win, their argument was we owe it to ourselves. It was a cute play on words. Americans own most of that debt. But they were also talking about, we owe it to ourselves. That's shameful. But we have become shameless. And until we do something about it, we'll bear the guilt of that shame. Fortunately, there are programs that have been provided to us to look at, which could have taken care of the problem before now. We don't have to slash the budget. We can reduce it by a few percent each year and maintain our current revenue. And at least my children may see the turning point on our national debt. We have to do something. Neither of the old parties is willing to do anything about it. They use it as a way to funnel money to their supporters and to their base. And it's a shame. Mr. Westerman, two minutes, sir. Well, John, that's another very important question. It's something that I ran on when I first went to Congress, and it's something that's still very important to me. I served for two terms on the Budget Committee, so I've got a pretty deep understanding of what's driving the debt in this country. And there's basically five areas in what's called mandatory spending that's driving the debt. It's Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, interest on the debt, and a host of about 82 social welfare programs. Those are mandatory sp spending items that make up about 75% of the spending. The problem with the debt is not revenue. The federal government continues to collect more revenue. It has to do with spending. The number one driver on spending is health care. That's why I filed the Fair Care Act of 2020, and I focused on lowering costs 
in covering more people and covering pre-existing conditions. Until we get health care under control in this country, it's going to be very difficult to deal with the debt. When we look at Democrat plans for health care, they want to do something called Medicare for all. I wouldn't call it Medicare for all. I would call it Medicaid for all, because what it'll do is do away with Medicare. It'll do away with the VA. It'll do away with private insurance. It'll do away with Medicaid. It'll put all Americans onto one government run program that the costs are astronomical and this will continue to drive the debt forward. We've got to work on getting the debt under control uh, before we have pandemics, before we have wars, because those are things that you have to spend money on. Those are valid reasons for raising the debt. But the other things that we're spending money on day after day after day that we just continue to turn a blind eye to, we have to start addressing those and it starts with health care. Back to Mr. Hanson, one minute, sir, for rebuttal. I think history will show this fact that the deficit has increased most significantly on the Republican administration. That's from Ronald Reagan. Uh, then we get to Donald Trump, uh, which has, his administration had made the de deficit balloon in significant ways. Uh, and my colleague uh, in the Libertarian Party, otherwise, I, there are things I like about libertarian philosophy. One, I like the strong focus on individual rights, but what concerns me is their view about limited government in other words, with that philosophical approach, I'm not sure that party is prepared to meet the moment that we're in right now. Uh, I, I believe in a strong individual uh, rights pro program. I'm a civil rights attorney. But there are times when we have to have a collectivist approach to how we work and serve with each other. And I'm not sure the Libertarian Party is quite ready to take, make that step. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. Mr. Tate has the next question, and it goes first to Mr. Gilbert. Arkansas ranks fourth worst in the nation in food insecurity for children with more than 23% of children not having consistent access to enough food for an active, healthy life. Poverty rates in Arkansas are also high with the fourth congressional district showing the highest level of poverty with almost 20% of its citizens classified as living at that level. What have you done or what would you do to address the economic inequality in the state that has extreme wealth localized in some areas and deep poverty in others. What I have done is very limited. My involvement in government has been at the local and county level. In those areas, though, there are things you can do. And the town of Tull, Grant County, is a small community, limited resources. It has become a suburb of Benton. Those kind of changes, though, are not the cause of government. They are the cause of natural processes. South Arkansas has suffered through the change in agriculture. The entire state of Arkansas has suffered through changes. But again, those natural processes can be ameliorated or expedited by the actions of government. And the government of Arkansas has an atrocious record in trying to level the playing field in trying to allow both ends of the political spectrum and the economic spectrum to advance themselves. This has become, may have always been, a good old boys state. The Republican Party takes care of the good old boys in northwest Arkansas. The Democrats take care of the good old boys in southeast Arkansas. And those of us who aren't friends or contributors to the major parties wind up fending for ourselves. It is unfortunate that Arkansas taxpayers have one of the highest tax rates in the nation. Depending on which report you read, we are either second, third, or fourth, maybe fifth, highest taxed population in the state. Combine that with economic base that has contracted in most of the area, falling incomes, and of course we have problems. The government has helped us with those problems. Mr. Westerman. Well, when we look at the, uh, the economics of the state of Arkansas, and particularly the 4th District, I think we've got a bright future ahead. Some of the things that I've done to help the economy in the 4th District, number one is the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. And contrary to what Democrats want to say about this, there's two parts to that bill. There were individual income tax cuts and there were corporate income tax cuts. The average median salary in the 4th District of Arkansas is about $45,000 per year. The 
constituents in the 4th District received an average of about $2,000 extra dollars of their money that they can keep in their pocket through the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. I don't see how you can say that it was a tax cut for wealthy people. We cut the, cut the corporate income tax, which is also good for the 4th District of Arkansas because it draws more companies back to the U.S. and creates more manufacturing jobs. We are blessed with abundant natural resources in the 4th District. I think we can use these resources to have a strong environment and a strong economy. If you look at what was happening before the pandemic, we had record low unemployment. Record low unemployment, not just across the board, but also for minorities and for women. Our economy was on fire. We were gonna see one of the strongest economic years ever before the pandemic hit. Also because of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, people were making more money because they were, they were not just getting to keep more of their tax money, they were making more money because wages were going up. Also, people were paying in more money to Medicare. Do you realize that the solvency of Medicare and Social Security actually got extended after the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. So when you hear people say, Republicans cut taxes, it's hurting Medicare and Social Security and it's hurting the economy and benefiting rich people, that is simply not true. Thank you, Mr. Westerman. Mr. Hansen. Food insecurity is one of the most pressing problems facing our state. Uh, my great-grandfather was born a slave, but he managed to acquire about 300 acres of land in Washtenaw County, Arkansas. He farmed it, his son farmed it, and my mother tells me during the Depression they were never hungry because they had food production. In a state where agriculture makes up about 25% of our income, I don't get it why we have such a big hunger problem. I was pleased to see the rice producers uh, donate food to, to, to food banks. Otherwise, we, we have all the natural resources we need. We obviously don't have an infrastructure or the political will to sort of tap into those resources to make sure that, that people have enough to eat. Uh, it was one in four before the pandemic, but now one in three children go to bed hungry. That's an untenable problem that we have in Arkansas. It's a problem that has a solution, I think, right in front of us. Uh, the government needs to get involved to make sure that people have enough food to eat, because if they don't have enough food to eat, that spins out into all other kinds of social problems. Uh, yeah. Right. Thank you, Mr. Hudson. Mr. Gilbert, one minute. Again, it's interesting to watch the Democrat and the Republican blame each other for a problem that they jointly created. The truth is that South Arkansas does have immense natural resources, and the farmers who receive government subsidies from this area, all too many of them, the checks go to large corporations in Chicago. South Arkansas has everything it needs except good government. The state of Arkansas, the federal government, to a large extent, the local governments of South Arkansas have not done right by the people of South Arkansas. There is a way you can begin to change that. We're not going to get title to land back from Illinois into Arkansas easily or quickly, but until we do something differently, this problem will persist. It's time to do something a little different. Ms. Lee has our next question. It goes first to Mr. Westerman. Mr. Westerman, in the wake of George Floyd's death and many other police-involved uh, cases, every week there are growing calls for police reform by protesters in the Black Lives Matter movement and other groups. Some go as far to say defund the police. What measures do you support? What measures do you oppose when it comes to police reform? And at what point does the federal government need to get involved? Well, you know, I believe the federal government does need to get involved. And what happened to George Floyd was unacceptable. And I think police officers will be the first to tell you that that kind of action is not acceptable. It's not something that's that common in police ranks. And police officers uh, dislike bad cops as much as anybody else does. We actually tried to propose a police reform bill. Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina and Representative Pete Stauber, who's a 25-year uh, police officer veteran from Minnesota, they had a bill, and it was based on bipartisan principles that came out of the Senate. You know what Senator Scott was told when he proposed that bill? He said it was just a token bill. Was it a token bill to create a study to look to see if we should still be doing no-knock warrants as much? Was it a token bill 
to buy body cameras for police officers? I don't think so. I think Democrats are good at, at defining problems, at, at recognizing problems, but they're poor when it comes to execution and so solving problems. Republicans have the solutions. We have bills out there that should be bipartisan bills, but because people don't necessarily want to solve these issues, those bills get held up. And I think what we've got to do is sit back and look and see what is best for our country. You know, black lives do matter. All lives matter. But with the organization Black Lives Matter, I'm not sure that I agree with everything that they say or that when you go to their website, you click on the donate button and it goes to Act Blue, which is a Democrat fundraising site. Uh, we got to quit politicizing all these issues and search for real problems and not just find those problems, but get the bipartisan support to implement those, uh, those solutions to the problems. Thank you, Mr. Westman. Mr. Hanson, two minutes. I've worked in law enforcement. I was an assistant attorney general for the state of Colorado, and I spent most of the last 10 years running a criminal justice program in a community college, training young people who wanted to go into law enforcement, teaching community policing. So I have a, a good idea of what these issues are. We have a systemic problem in, in policing around race, and, and all the data supports that. Now, most I've worked with law enforcement at every level, and most of the ma vast majority of the people you're talking about want to do good policing, want to serve the community. But we do have to really deal with these problems. Well, one, we need a use of force continuum in, in terms of when police can, can really begin to use deadly force. We need independent investigators. In other words, uh, as an attorney, in other words, it's, it's difficult when a, a DA has to prosecute a police officer that, that he or she works with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it's a conflict that's just waiting to happen. So most states like California have started uh, using independent investigators. So I think that's the first step that we have. We need to have body cams. And that's the thing that it really has exposed all the things that are happening uh, in terms of the racial eye shooting that have occurred. Uh, it, it's a big problem, and even here in Arkansas, we, we have to really start working on our criminal justice system. 15% of the population in Arkansas is African American, but 42% of the people in our prisons are African American. Now, I'm, I'm a social scientist, but my limited knowledge is, of statistics tells me that something is inherently wrong there, so, so there are some problems up and down the process that we need to really start looking at. Uh, the thing that Senator Scott's bill wanted to do, we already know that. I, I know about no-knock warrants, and I, they're, they're, we already know what we need to do about them. And I think that we just need to get serious about it, and that's the real problem, that there's lack of political will to really begin to make this happen. We go to Mr. Gilbert, two minutes. I had some personal experience in law enforcement when I was the mayor of Tull. We hired police officers. And I knew of other small towns and not so small towns in Arkansas who hired policemen. And I'll tell you now, I believe the problem is at its root, one of accountability. When I hired a policeman, I didn't have to worry about what kind of cop he was gonna be. I'm covered. I've got legal liability. My actions as mayor exempted me from almost any action I took. And the policemen that we hired had similar protections. Until we look at local law enforcement for what it is, neighbors helping neighbors, not bullies collecting fines for speeding, we're gonna to continue to have this problem. We can explore it from the right, from the left, but the truth is it's in our hearts and it's in our communities. We had a couple of the best police officers in the world in Tull, men who were there to help the citizens of the community. And when it came time to write a ticket for speeding, one of our officers took an unusual approach. Instead of writing that ticket, he would slow the person down by stopping and talking to them for 15 minutes. Now friend, if you're in a hurry to get somewhere and you're viola violating the speed limit, those 15 minutes of conversation hurt a lot more than a traffic ticket. That's the kind of policing that works. Unfortunately, the Republicans, and to some degree even the Democrats, have militarized the police to the point that when they show up at your door for a no-knock, they may be riding in a military vehicle. We've got to stop it. Back to Mr. Westerman, one minute, sir. 
you know, as we consider this issue, I think we have to uh, look deeper than just uh, some of the things that have been brought up today. I visit with police officers and sheriff's deputies all around uh, my district. And I know that they get up every morning and they put that uniform on and they go out there to protect and to, and to serve. And that's what 99.9% .9 of them do. And for them to be brought into this debate and be vilified and to see proposals to cut funding to law enforcement is one of the craziest things that I've seen uh, this country uh, talk about in a debate. We have to support our police officers. We have to support law enforcement. We have to take care of the bad actors and give those officers who are out there doing their job every day the, the respect and the resources that they need. It's gonna make it very difficult to recruit people into law enforcement if we keep up this nonsense. John Lovett has our next question and it goes first to Mr. Hanson. Mr. Hanson, um, on the issue of abortion, what are your views on that and uh, when, if ever, is abortion acceptable to you? I think the uh, real issue needs to be framed as pro-choice and anti-choice. I think the whole notion of pro-life and pro-choice, that, that doesn't really capture the, the essence of what we're talking about. I'm pro-choice. I believe in a woman's right to, con to control what's happening in her body. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm for abortion, but I'm pro-choice. Well, why is that? The only analogy that comes to mind to me as an African-American is that there's a great book, it's called The American Slave Coast. And in that book, it talks about the history of slave breeding in this country. For 250 years, African-American women and men had no control of their body. Uh, when we banned slave importation, we started breeding slaves. Women were forced to there are babies who became slaves. Now, this is a, not the exact same thing, but I don't think the government has any right at any time to tell a woman what to do with her body. Now, I understand the moral and the religious implications of that, but for me, that's a conversation between a woman and her God. It's not my call. To Mr. Gilbert, two minutes, sir. I'm pro-life. I think Arkansas had it just about right before Roe v. Wade. The state of Arkansas, if an abortion was committed, charged the doctor. He could be fined, he could lose his license, if you continue, you could eventually wind up in jail. The woman could never be the perpetrator of that crime. She was the victim. That even went to the Arkansas Supreme Court local prosecutor wanted to charge the lady as well as the doctor and the Arkansas Supreme Court upheld that no you could not charge the mother in an abortion. That was our stance pre Roe v. Wade. I think most Arkansans could still live with that and a lot of children could live with that as well. The truth is that we do have individual rights to what happens to our bodies. But when we exercise that right and conceive a child, there is a third party involved who is blameless and should not be the victim of an abortion. The Bible in Numbers even identifies that a child is not the same as in, in utero. The punishment for damaging a child in utero was not the same as for killing or damaging the mother or a living child. With those kinds of guidance, I believe Arkansas could once again find its way to a sensible approach to abortion and let California find whatever they want to. The problem is we have nationalized a local issue. What Arkansas wants is not necessarily what Massachusetts needs and vice versa. Mr. Westerman, two minutes. John, again, another good question. I'm unequivocally and, un and unapologetically pro-life. I could say that stems from my religious convictions, but I'll set that aside for a moment and I'll go to the founding documents of this country. The Declaration of Independence, our founders said that we believe that we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
If you deny a child the right to life, you've denied that, denied that child every right that's out there. We have to be aggressively pro-life. I believe that the Roe v. Wade decision, decision was one of the worst things that's ever happened in this country. We've lost millions and millions of babies because of that decision. Another bad thing about that decision is that it was made by the Supreme Court. It wasn't made by the legislature, the Congress. It wasn't made by a president. It was made by judicial rule in the Supreme Court, and it needs to be overturned. When we look at rights that we have, the right to life far outweighs any right to choice. And as long as I'm in Congress, I will continue to fight to put it in law that children have the right to live. We had a discharge petition because the speaker wouldn't bring it to the floor to have a bill that says you can't do these late term abortions that the state of Virginia and the state of uh, New York was pushing, have pushed through in their states. The speaker won't let the bill come to the floor. We need pro-life Republicans in Congress, in the White House, and we need to pass a law to protect the lives of the innocent. Back to Mr. Hanson, one minute, sir. Uh, Mr. Gilbert's uh, evocation of states' rights is, is pretty scary to me because when I hear someone talking about what Arkansas can do and what California can do, it reminds me of what Bull Connor did in the 60s and what other segregationists did. We live in the United States of America, in other words, and a woman should have a right that, uh, to control her body no matter wh inside what state's border she's in. Uh, this whole notion of pro-life, in other words, uh, it baffles me. Pro-life to me, in other words, is not separating babies at the border. Pro-life to me is not uh, forcing women, immigrants, to have hysterectomies. Pro-life to me is making sure t children don't go to bed hungry. Now, like Mr. Westerman, I don't want to get into the religious implications for this because we are not a theocracy. In other words, we are, we are a country that separates religion from our governance. And the whole notion that uh, you can tell a woman, as I mentioned, what she can do with her body is really getting close to what you did to African-American women, women in this country doing slavery. Thank you. Mr. Hanson, thank you. We have reached the point in our program for closing arguments. And again, as was determined prior to the broadcast, Mr. Gilbert drew that first straw. Mr. Gilbert, you have two minutes, sir. Thank you. What a pleasure. And again, thank you to those of you who are here grilling us. You've done a great job. A couple of things. My friend on my left, uh, talked earlier about the, the assets of the 4th District of Arkansas. And he, he framed it in a partisan way as if the Democrats were going to give away the store and the Republicans were protecting it. And I'm sure Mr. Hansen could make a dissimilar argument. The truth is the store was given away by the politicians of Arkansas over many decades. Mr. Hanson uh, compared my position on abortion to Bull Connor, which is blatantly unfair. The two are so dissimilar as to make it unnecessary to rebut it. But the rights of children have to come into the equation at some point. Friends, voters, as I said earlier, we have one decision to make here today. Your decision who to vote for should not be for who's the brightest, who's the most moral, or who's the best looking. What way do you want the federal government to go in its relationship to you, the voters, and the taxpayers of Arkansas? If you are satisfied with either one of the approaches that you've seen here, presented here today by the old parties, then flip a coin and cast a vote. If you believe it's time to do something different, to try a third way, a little different approach, something that might shake things up a little bit, then send one member of Congress, a libertarian from Arkansas, who's not sold out to and bought by the party interest. Thank you. Mr. Hansen is thanked, or excuse me, Mr. Gilbert is thanked. Mr. Hansen, you're next with closing argument. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you all on the panel for such a great questions and my colleagues here as well for uh, participating with me today. The decision we make in November uh, 
It's going to have a profound impact on our state and our nation. For too long, Arkansas has languished on the bottom end of most statistics that determine our quality of life. In 2018, a U.S. News uh, survey ranked us in the top 10 on natural environment and social environment. We are the natural state. And so, so that really reflected who we are. Well, we were ranked 45th overall because we were brought down with low scores on crime and correction, health care, economy, jobs, education. Now, when I grew up most of my life, we were nicknamed the land of opportunity. Now, I'm not trying to start a bill to get that back, but I think we need to sort of focus on what that really means. And, and I think we can change that. But in order to do that, you're going to have to elect leaders in Washington and in the state that really have the courage to start making those changes. I want to be that person for you. And in November, I want to ask for your vote. Thank you. Mr. Hanson, thank you. Mr. Westerman, two minutes. Thank you, Steve. And I would also like to extend my thanks to Mr. Hanson and Mr. Gilbert for participating in the debate and for PBS for, again, for having this debate and to our panelists for the great questions that you ask. Uh, early voting starts soon. People have a choice to make. If you want a candidate who's from the 4th District, who was born and raised here, who loves the 4th District, who has worked hard for you in Congress to protect those fundamental rights that are outlined in the Bill of Rights and those rights that are summarized in the Declaration of Independence, then I think you want to vote to send me back to Washington to represent those rights for you again. If you believe in free speech, freedom of religion, the Second Amendment, if you're pro-life, if those things are near and dear to you, you want somebody that's going to go there that has a proven record to fight for those things. If you want an engineer that's a problem solver, if you want a forester that looks into the future, that looks at long-term solutions, then I believe I'm the person you want to send back to Washington, D.C. It's not enough just to identify problems and try to scare people or make people mad about the problems. We've got to have real concerted efforts on solving problems. That's what I've done while I've served in Congress. That's what I will continue to do, and I would appreciate your vote. Mr. Westerman, thank you. Thanks to all of our candidates and, uh, of course, to our panel. This concludes our Arkansas PBS debate for the 4th District. Again, we thank our candidates, our journalists, and in a moment, the candidates for Congress in the 3rd District. In the meantime, for all of us at Arkansas PBS, thank you very much for joining us, and we hope you'll stay tuned. Major funding for Election 2020 Arkansas PBS Debates provided by AARP Arkansas.